uh, today, I'd like to invite you to open our Bible from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 26. First uh, Cham- Samuel. First Samuel chapter 26. I invite us to take turn in reading this chapter. I will read verse 1, and all of you will read verse 2, and we take turn until the last verse of chapter 26. Okay, 1 Samuel chapter uh, 26. I'll start verse 1. Then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding himself on the hill of Hakila, which is on the east of uh, Jesimon? And Saul and Cam on the hill of Hakila, which is beside the road on the east of Jesimon. But David remained in the wilderness. When he saw that Saul came up after him into the wilderness, then David rose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay with Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of his army. Saul was lying within the encampment while the army was encamped around him. So David and Abisai went to the army by night, and there lay Saul sleeping within the encampment, with his spear, spear stuck in the ground at his head, and Abner and the army lay around him. But David said to Abisai, Do not destroy him, for who can put his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but take now the spear that is at his head and the jar of water, and let us go. Then David went over to the other side and stood far off on the top of the hill with a great space between them. And David said to Abner, Are you not a man who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not kept watch over your lord the king? For one of the people came in to destroy the king, your lord. Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is this your voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. Now therefore let my Lord the King hear the words of his servants. If it is the Lord who has stirred you up against me, may he accept an offering. But if it is man, may they be cursed before the Lord. For they have driven me out uh, this day, that I should have no share in the heritage of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do you harm, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have acted foolishly, foolishly, and have made a great mistake. Then 
The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I will not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be you, my son David. You will do many things and will succeed in them. So David went his way and Saul returned to his place. Let us pray one more time, ask for God's mercy. We have read your word, O Lord, and now we pray that your Holy Spirit be poured into our hearts and fill our our mind and lead our imagination so that as we listen to your word, we will see your glory and we will hear your truth and we willingly obey to your direction. May you bless each one of us uh, here this afternoon. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks and pray. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, uh, if you remember the story of 1 Samuel chapter 24, which about three weeks ago we uh, preached about this, this uh, chapter, there are clearly many similarities with the one we have just read in chapter 26. The similarities are not only in the title that uh, our Bible gives, ESV gives, uh, David spares Saul again. Yeah, so the word again meaning that um, David spared Saul's life uh, before. Probably you still remember how David spared Saul's life in the cave when he cut the corner of Saul's rope. Although he was certainly in the position to be able to cut more than just the rope. But Saul in the structure of this, uh, uh, but also in the structure of the story, if you look at close, closely, there, there are many similarities uh, between chapter 24 and chapter 26. So this, 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 uh, 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 this similarities leads for many biblical criticism scholars to say that this chapter actually the divergent accounts of the same incident. However, Real history shows that detailed similarities uh, does not always require identity. For example, if you read the history of the church, there are quite a few stories that are very similar in many details, which is in fact telling us two very different persons. For example, uh, the story of St. John Columbini and St. Ignatius Loyola. Maybe we kind of familiar with Ignatius Loyola, he had the name. Both actually died on the 31st of July, and they both founded religious order dedicated to the same pattern. The one is Jesuites, and the one is Jesuits, very similar name. And both Columbini and Loyola, uh, 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 of, uh, uh, both of these orders that they built were suppressed by the popes bearing the same name. Yeah, the one uh, suppressed the, the, uh, uh, the order of the release order, uh, uh, Jesuites suppressed by Pope Clement the Ninth. When you see the nine is one X. Yeah, one X is nine. It's uh, in the Romans, yeah. But and also, but the, the, the one founded by uh, Loyola is suppressed by Pope Clement the 14, 14 is X, 1, V, 14. So very similar, yeah, very similar. So people uh, will say that, this, is, it, is it actually the same account with just the different uh, variation? Uh, but if you look at the, that, the church history, we, the, the history tells us that Columbini died on the 31st of July, 1367 while Ignatius Loyola died on the 31st of July, 1556. is a hundred years difference, yeah? So the talks, although many, many similarity, it tells about different, different, very different person. So, although the, this chapter of 26 has many similarity with chapter 24, um, 
this story actually focus on a rather different team. And I, I'll, I'll give the team today uh, uh, about the dynamic of the faithful life. That's the team that we are going to uh, ponder uh, this afternoon. There are four th things uh, that we would like to learn about this, the dynamic of the faithful life. The first one is in verse 6 to 12, we will see the passions faith maintains. How our faith uh, produces the passions uh, that we, we, we need. David and his men, uh, uh, the Mossad-like spies, as I said before, have tracked Saul's movement, and as Saul and his 3,000 chosen men arrived near Ziv and camped at the hill of Hakila. Verse 5b says, Saul was lying within the encampment while the army was encamped around him. You can imagine here, the guards of Saul, chosen men, were protecting the king layers by layers. Yeah, maybe the outer layers and then the inner, inner layers and the inner layer, even the innermost layer is where uh, Saul was sleeping in his tent. And with Abner, the commander of the army, sleeps beside the king. More than that, King Saul also prepared a spear stuck in the ground at his head, just in case, as the last defense. That night, or any other night, the king sleeps safe and sound, surrounded by 3,000 of his chosen men. But is he really safe? We read that David and Abisai somehow were able to stealthily enter Saul's tent. Then Abisai says in verse 8, come back to the word here, verse 8, Abisai says, um, this, is the way, this is the day of the Lord. Yeah? God has given you uh, enemy into your hand this day. Now please let me pin him to the, to the earth with one stroke of the spear and I will not strike him twice. Only I need one strike of a spear and Saul should be gone. But then David replies to him, verse 9, he said to Abisai, do not destroy him for who can put his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And he continued, as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go down into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but take now the spear that is uh, at his head and the jar of water, and let us go. Here we see the same patient and restraint as in chapter 24. But it is a deeper patience and a more informed restraint. For one thing, David has learned something from his near disaster with Nabal in the previous chapter. Chapter 25, uh, verse 38 says, the Lord struck Nabal. The word struck uh, in, in Hebrew uh, is uh, nagab. The Lord struck Nabal and he died. And here in, chap in verse 10, uh, David says, the Lord will strike Nagab. The same word come again. The Lord will strike Saul. So the, the use of the same verb may indicate that David has learned that Yahweh can be trusted to handle both fools and oppressors if he wills. Yahweh may be pleased to strike Saul as he did Nabal. But the interesting and important lesson is this. David fully believed that Yahweh will handle Saul, but he never dictates the way that Yahweh will work. He believed that Yahweh will help him, but he submitted himself to God's sovereignty to do as he pleases. First 10 says, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go down into battle and perish. Or he have a lot of imagination and he can imagine the Lord can work uh, in many other ways. He does not dictate how God should work in his life, 
how God should help him in his life. This is actually an important aspect of a true faith. The faith looks to the grandeur, majesty, and ability of Yahweh, who can do in many different ways beyond our imagination. In fact, if we have, if we, in fact, if, uh, we have desperate need of this kind of imaginative faith because our minds are so sluggish, uncreative, and proud, insisting for God to work in a certain way according to our will. But if you look at Isaiah uh, verse 40, for example, I'll read it for you, a few verses from Isaiah verse 40, uh, from verse 12, for example, we can see how God um, is uh, much, much bigger than what we can know uh, of him. Isaiah 40, verse 12, I'll read it for you. Um, this is uh, the word of the prophet Isaiah says about the Lord, who, can, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what may show him his counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon will not suffice for fuel, nor, as is, nor are its bees enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. This is, we can see here uh, how we, we need to know the true God, especially in the context of the tensions between nations that we are facing. We, we've been hearing the cyber war in, in, in China and, and Australia and everywhere else, and nuclear war and, and, and so on. You can see how we, we, we can uh, we, uh, see, uh, imagine that we seems that to see that how powerful our nations are, but it is, it is just like, like nothing. All nations are as nothing before God. They are counted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. You can see in Isaiah how the prophet gives us a picture of a God that we really seldom to contemplate and therefore the God whom we barely know. Such imagination does not falsify God, but instead will help us finding him. Such imagination will not lead us beyond the truth of God, but will help us arrive at the truth of God. The wonderful, majestic, and great God beyond all our imagination. A God who can never be domesticated by our very limited understanding. On the other side, although this true faith confesses that it cannot understand all of God's way, the true faith understands what it should or should not do. Although David did not know how God will handle Saul, David understand that he should not put out his hands against the Lord's anointed. The, the situation is not limited to great figures of salvation history like David. Any believer will face predicaments in which he does not know how God will bring relief but he does know what is or is not God's will for him. For example, a Christian cannot guess how Christ will bring resolution to his marital problem, but he knows that he, for instance, must not commit adultery against his wife. Christians do not know whether God will hear our loved ones, but we know that whatever God's design is good, is right for us. 
This kind of faith gives us patience to wait upon the Lord in whatever situation that we are facing. God's ways will frequently baffle us. They will still baffle us. But God's will is sufficiently clear to lead us in the meantime. That is all we need for the moment. That is the first point, the, the, uh, the passion faith maintains. Then when we, we, this leads us to the second point that we read from uh, this uh, chapter of 1 Samuel 26. When we faithfully obey what God has revealed to us, it is often the case that God in His grace and mercy, gives us encouragement and strength that we need. This we see from uh, in the first uh, uh, in the verses 20, uh, 13 to to, uh, to thirteen to sixteen. As a reader, uh, a reader's mind simply refused to be quiet when reading verse six to eleven. Uh, how is it? We ask that David and Abishai gain unhindered access to Saul's and Abner's location, even be able to enter Saul's tent. Verse 12 explained to us. Verse 12 explained to us. So David took the spear and the jar of water from Saul's head, and they went away. No man saw it. No man knew it nor did any awake, for they were all asleep, because deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. Uh, we are watching not merely David's skill here, but ultimately Yahweh's hand is at work. Saul is helpless because Yahweh met him that way. So David's call to Abner on verse 14 must have come like a thunder in the death of the night when he says, verse 14 to Abner, Abner, will you not answer? Then Abner answered, who are you? Calls to the king. And David said to Abner, are you not a man who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not kept watch over the, your lord the king? For one of the prophets came in to destroy the king, your Lord. So, uh, um, this word says that no, no one can protect Saul from David's hands, not even 3,000 soldiers, not even Abner, the chief commander. All Saul's men should be court martial and executed for failure to protect the life of the king. And David isn't joking. The evidence is damning. Look where the king's spear and the water jug are. With both truth and irony, Saul could have said, there is but a step between me and death. It was a sign for Saul that his power is gone and nothing can keep David from obtaining the kingdom. But it it is also a sign for David. David should receive it as encouragement from Yahweh that he will certainly give David the kingdom. Not even Abner and 3,000 soldiers can protect Saul from David's hand. Yahweh tends to be that kind of God, one who reaches out to his tired and wearied servant. And in the midst of their discouragement, grants them some plain token, some small evidence that he has not forgotten his word and promises to them. There's an interesting story that John Flavel, one of the Puritan, wrote uh, uh, what's about, about some lady called Mrs. Honeywood. This Mrs. Honeywood is a, uh, an earnest Christian who nevertheless felt God has cast her off and that she was without saving hope. 
One day, a minister was meeting with her and tried to encourage her by sharing the word and the promises of God. It was, uh, but it, it makes her angry, actually. He, he, she responded with anger, and it was then she took a big vast glass from the table and said, Sir, I am as sure to be damned as this glass is to be broken. And with that word, she threw the glass vast mightily to the ground. But to the astonishment of both the minister and hers, the glass remained intact and unbroken. Surely the minister did not fail to comply the assuring sign that God actually cared for her. You, we, we, you should consider that little things that happens in our lives. Words from brothers and sisters, even words from your children, are some plain token to remind us that we have a God who understands and cares for us. Therefore, let us be always faithful and wait for God's grace and mercy, which will be poured out to us in our time of need. Thirdly, brothers and sisters, uh, we shall see that obeying God faithfully and receiving God's grace does not mean that we will not experience distress and struggle. That is uh, verse 17 and 20. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll read especially verse 19 and 20. I thought long and hard about the meaning of this verse. It's, it's a difficult verse. What, what does it mean, verse 19 and 20? The word of uh, David here. When he said, uh, he said to, to Saul, Now let, therefore let my Lord the King hear the words of, my, of his servants. If it is the Lord who has stirred you up against me, may he accept an offering. But if it is man, may they be cursed before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day that I should have no share in the heritage of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. Now therefore let not my blood fall to the earth away from the presence of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a single flea like one who hunts partridge in the mountains. Partridge is just a, a calling bird. It's because, because uh, uh, David was calling to Abner in the middle of the night. It's, he used that that's, uh, picture. I, I thought long and hard about the, this, the meaning of 1920. What does it mean? Commentary surely helped me to, to understand this, this distress words of David. Yeah, that's, that's what it is. It is a distress words of David. Essentially, David is saying to Saul that if it is Yahweh who has stirred Saul up against David, let Saul capture him and offer him as a sacrifice. But obviously, David knew that it is Saul's man and Saul's own envy that made him pursue David as someone who hunts a partridge, a calling bird in the mountain. If it is man, may they, may they be cursed before the Lord, David says. And here, David expresses his distress because he was pushed to leave the promised land where the tabernacle was located. You should remember that tabernacle was a symbolic place where the Lord was present in the worship of his people. Of course, David understands that God is omnipresent, as Psalm 139, one of the Psalms of David, shows. Wherever I go, if I go to the highest, highest uh, heaven, he is there. If I go to the deepest, the darkest pit, he was there. God is omnipresent. He knows that. But David was not referring to uh, about the omnipresence of God here. David was referring to the special presence of God in the sanctuary where he meets with his people in worship, in prayer, and sacrifice. When he was driven away from the land, David felt he was being cut off from the presence of Yahweh and told to go and serve other gods. That's what it means. And this is David's most severe grief and distress. 
As we can see, this is expressed in the Psalm of 63, another Psalm of David, David's Psalm. He says there, Psalm 63, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary there. The word sanctuary, sanctuary, the tabernacle, sanctuary there. Beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. Even in his distress, David has much to teach us. Especially in the situation that we are facing now. Although it is certainly true that we can still worship God in our own home, let us remember that we are one body of Jesus. And we are the family of God. And even the name church, as we are, the church of God, means we are called out to assemble before the Lord. So let us at least have a deep longing uh, to come together again to worship when the time comes and to have a deep and meaningful fellowship together as the body of Christ, as the family of God, to assemble before the Lord. This is what David was experiencing when he was being cut off, being pursued from the land of the Lord the land, the, the promised land. Lastly, brothers and sisters, uh, in the midst of his distress, God's people will still have the hope of faith. That is what is written in the verse 21 to 24. Um, I read verse 21. Then Saul said, responding to, to David's words, Saul said, I have seen, return, my son David, for I will no more do you harm, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have acted foolishly and have made a great mistake. In this one verse, Saul actually responded with a confession, with an invitation to David, and a promise that he will not do any harm to David, and a rational, all rolled into this one verse, verse 21. But David is wise enough not to trust Saul just like that. After all, Saul, after all, Saul had said himself to be a fool, and David did not want to be one also. Verse 24 is very interesting. Here, uh, I read again for you, verse 24. The word of David responded to the invitation of Saul. David says, Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord, and may he deliver me out of all tribulation. We uh, might have expected, David will say uh, here, uh, as, my life is, as, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so my life be precious in your sight. Yeah, that is the parallel. We, we might expect that David says that, but he did not. He says that, as, my life is pre as, as your life is precious in my sight this day, uh, may so my life be precious, not in Saul's sight, but in the sight of the Lord. David is not looking to Saul. He's not hoping on Saul. He's not believing Saul. He's only looking to Yahweh, hoping on Yahweh, and trusting only Yahweh, who will certainly reward every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. May my life be precious in the sight of the Lord, and may he deliver me out of all tribulation. This is the hope of faith that David has and he himself saw the time when he could turn this prayer to praise, this trust, to gratitude. When he says in 2 Samuel 4, 9, this has become the reality. 
when, when David says, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life out of every tribulation. So in closing, brothers and sisters, we see the last sentence here. The last sentence of this chapter says, So David went his way, and Saul returned to his place. The, this word could give us an impression that both David and Saul go alone in their own ways. It is certainly true in one case, but not in the other. Saul certainly go alone in his own ways without God, uh, uh, without God uh, be present with him. But David has the Lord who is determined to deliver him from every tribulation. And he walked in the presence of the Lord in all the days of his life. Koram Deo. That is the life of David. Let us learn from his life as he, um, in his distress, in his tribulation, he keep uh, following God, uh, following Christ, fo fo uh, uh, be, be patient and uh, understanding that God is with him all the day of his life brings all the difference for him in everything that he do, his mission, his work, his, his, um, uh, his, uh, his, his, his way of life. It's all different because he understands God is with him all the way of his life. Let us bow our heads and let us pray. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Let us all stand together. I surrender all. I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. I invite Brother Yijin to lead us in the closing prayer. Yeah, you can... Let us pray. Our faithful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, truly you have shown your love to us yesterday, today, and forevermore. Just as the hymn goes, one with you, we cannot die. Some men trust in chariots, some men in horses, but we trust in you, for your faithfulness endures forever, and our soul lies in your bosom peacefully and in security. Bless us and remind us of your faithful, unchanging love every day, every night. And as we ponder on your word, speak to us in gentleness and in strong persuasion of your spirit. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.